The following was recorded on November 3rd, 2019, so I don't want to hear no whining about dated info. Listen up, Clydes! You're listening to the Big Bad Bastich Book Club, your premier podcast dedicated to the orniest bastich in the whole known verse, Lobo the Main Man. I'm your host, to explain later, with a co-host today... You can call me Taylor. Ta- Taylor, just <laughs> just Taylor, nothing like the Tay Man, the Tay, the Tay Tiz, or... Uh, T-Bone. T-Bone? <laughs> what is this, a 90s rap video? <laughs> Uh, but uh, welcome to a new podcast from the uh, To Explain Later podcast, fam- something like that. I, was ex- I, don't, I don't know what else to do for the intro. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. Uh, but this is a comic book based podcast. We're going to talk about some Lobo comics today. Uh, give you give sort of like a review, a rundown. But first, let's do a little bit of a get to know get to know you thing. So, uh, Taylor. Taylor, T-Bone, mm-hmm. how about yeah. you start? How did you first get into comics? Well, thinking back to when I like read my first comic, I had a couple of friends in high school, and they had been reading comics. Like Their dads had a bunch of comic books at their place, and so I just went over to one of their houses, and uh, yeah, I seen he had like the whole first series of Ghost Rider, and he had... Like, a whole bunch of Fantastic Fours and, like, these, like, little five-cent books and just kind of all kinds of stuff. So, like, the only exposure I had before was video games and cartoons. And so just seeing that there's more to it, I think, is, like, what got me really interested. So just borrowing their books, starting to read into some of the characters, and then, uh, like, just meeting more people, like, around that time. That's, like, when... uh, like Iron Man first came out and so that's like the the beginning of this MCU that we see. Yeah. And uh yeah. Cool. So it was really like discovering that there was something more to all these characters that you've seen in video games and television that really got mm-hmm. you into the comics. That's yeah. really cool. Now how about when it comes to the main man? What was your first intro to Lobo? <laughs> My first intro to Lobo is actually like I I didn't know about Lobo until I seen him on uh, Injustice. On Injustice? The the video game. Really? For you, his first appearance was the Injustice appearance? (laughs) For me, yeah. Uh Wow, that is bonkers. I got some crazy news for you. Uh, The one thing that made me really hyped for Lobo and Injustice was the fact that there have been several video game projects featuring Lobo that were canceled back in the 90s. And we'll Hmm. talk more about Lobo getting canceled (laughs) later. But one of them was a Lobo fighting game. Mm -hmm. So for me, the fact that Lobo wasn't the first character that they considered putting into Injustice was like an insult because a Lobo fighting game has been trying to get off the ground Mm -hmm. for decades. Yeah. And uh, for him to finally show up in a fighting game, that was just awesome for Hmm. me as a Lobo fan. But for me... To explain later, getting into comics, uh, I was always interested in superheroes as a kid. Like you, I grew up with all the superhero TV shows Mm -hmm. of the early 2000s and the 90s, like Batman the Animated Series and the Mm -hmm. Justice League cartoon show and the Spider-Man Animated Series. And uh, Mm -hmm. the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man films were a big thing for me because it was the first thing that really (laughs) made these comic book characters tangible to me, Mm -hmm. Uh, more so than... Batman Returns, which was something that I grew up watching before Spider-Man, it always felt like a little goofy for me. 
Uh, but I guess it could also be that I, I couldn't connect with Batman as a character growing up. But mm-hmm. also, I didn't think too hard about it at the time because I was very little. It was just like, what is this creepy movie that I can't help but watch? Uh, but yeah, like stuff like Batman Returns and Spider-Man and the 2000 Spider-Man movies really got me into superheroes. But what got me into comics was uh, my Uncle Ben notice that i was drawing all these superheroes and he actually like showed me his comic collection and gave me a bunch of his books so when he bestowed these comics upon you did he say the famous with with... great power comes great Uh responsibility no (laughs) no he did not Uh that would have been that would have been funny though uh but yeah my uncle is really who got me into comics uh i wouldn't really uh learn about Lobo as a comic book character. I knew about Lobo before I got into comics, but even then, I didn't know the name of the character. I just knew him as this cool biker guy who showed up in the Justice League cartoon Mm -hmm. with this really deep, gravelly voice, voiced by Brad Garrett, which for me, that is the Lobo voice. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until I discovered discovered the internet or I first started using the internet that I was like, you know what, I'm going to look up this character that showed up in Justice League because he was cool. Mm -hmm. It was just two episodes, but he was really cool. And that's when I found out it was Lobo. As soon as, like, I started working and making my own money, I started buying Lobo comics. Mm -hmm. The uh, first Lobo comic that I really got was the Last Zarnian miniseries, the four-issue miniseries by Keith Giffen with art by Simon Bisley. For a bunch of Lobo fans, for myself, that's, like, where you start with Lobo. Mm -hmm. It's not the beginning of Lobo, but that's really, like, if you want to know, get the deal of who this character is... With that four issue miniseries is where you start, and I'm really starting to regret that those are not the comics we're covering this podcast. <laughs> uh, yeah. Maybe, maybe the next one if we get to, to be continued, right? To be continued, mm-hmm. to explain later, to be continued later. Uh, but that was my intro to Lobo. Yeah, and I've heard that. I mean, I, I've seen them too, but uh, I, I'm sure there's more. But uh, some of those one shot. Lobo comics I've come across too, like uh, yeah. when he takes out Santa Claus for the Easter Bunny. <laughs> the um, uh, Lobo paramilitary Christmas special. Actually, yeah. by the time I finish editing this and actually putting it out into the internet, it will mm-hmm. probably be Christmas, mm-hmm. which is <laughs> another thing that I, I think we should have the Lobo paramilitary Christmas special. Uh-huh. Uh, this is all kind of like haphazardly put together. This is... I. I've been doing a Mortal Kombat podcast with our friend Mickey, and uh, I've been getting into comic book podcasts a lot recently, and I'm like, you know what, I really want to try this out, test the waters. Mm -hmm. So maybe next holiday season we'll cover, uh, if uh, we can get together through Skype or something, we could do the Lobo Paramilitary Christmas Special and the uh, Lobo Authority Holiday Hell crossover. (laughs) There you go. Yeah. That would be awesome. Uh, Uh, Yeah, that's a good one shot. and uh, But I think... Uh, covering these two, because even these two in comparison next to each other, the the two that we're covering today, they're pretty different from each other. But I'm oh, not yeah. I'm not a, a true like long lasting Lobo fan, so I'm no. curious what you know how he compares in these to like your first exposure to him. And then, you know, I'm sure he's different in the the holiday special. That's definitely going to be something worth talking about. Also, don't touch the desk. It rattles and makes noise. (laughs) Sorry. Speaking with my hands over here. Um, We actually have been talking about, like, what comics we're going to be reviewing today, but we haven't actually said what they were. Mm -hmm. So I figured what better way to kick off a Lobo podcast, a big, bad, bastich book club, than starting with the beginning and sort of go with recent appearances to compare and contrast the two. So we're covering Omega Men number three, Lobo's first appearance in comic books ever. Then we're going to be doing a review of Justice League of America, the 2017 annual from Steve Orlando, from his run of uh, the Justice League of America comic, which is pretty interesting. For me, I thought it was a good one-shot. Uh, as a Lobo story, but we'll get into more of those thoughts later. For now, we got to do a Lobo news rundown. You must be thinking to yourself, Taylor, mm-hmm. there's Lobo news? Is there? Yep. Yeah, yeah there is. <laughs> I pretty much have you. I'd also, to sort of like go back to what you were saying about how you're not like a long-lasting Lobo fan, you're one of yeah. the few friends that I have that uh-huh. I can just talk to with 
on hours of hours about comic books. So that's why I have you on. <laughs> and which is great because I have a working understanding of a lot of characters and Lobo yeah. is one that I'm really interested in. Just haven't gotten to yet. So just lay it on me because, you know, it's I not will, all going to stick, but, you know, I'm interested. I will lay it on hot and heavy. <laughs> Good. As a frag on a Friday. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, to the Lobos news rundown. So the first bit of news is kind of some sad news, but the uh, Krypton got canceled before they could go into season three, and part of that included the sci-fi spinoff they were going to do starring Emmett J. Scanlon as Lobo, the Lobo spinoff show. Although Mm. there has been rumors from the letter that the main producer of the show distributed about the show being canceled in his final thoughts on the show and his response to Emma J. Scanlon uh, tweeting about how he just started to get really beefed up for the Lobo show because he felt bad about being so under muscled Mm. on Krypton season two and uh, his main response was that like the Lobo show might not be as dead as we think so hopefully something comes out of that if not it's a real shame that yet another project featuring Lobo got cancelled the fighting game, the action game, the movie that was going to be directed by Guy Ritchie, and now the sci-fi TV show, which is a real shame because I thought Emma J. Scanlon did a pretty good job for that version of Lobo that they were going for. Also in the news, uh, Lobo had appeared in appeared in Young Justice Season 3 on the DC Universe app. He had one heavy appearance in one episode and then uh he also had some minor appearances here and there specifically his thumb and then it all culminated in this post credit scene where a mini lobo is grown out of his thumb (laughs) and then lobo stomps it to death (laughs) oh wow (laughs) and just walks off A Storm Collectible was also announced, and it's available for pre-order of Lobo based off his appearance in Injustice, so that's something to look forward to. One thing I do like from the Storm Collectible figure is that the face model that they went to isn't actually based off the Injustice game. It looks closer to Lobo's appearance on the covers for Lobo Unbound and the Simon Bisley art Lobo. That's just awesome for me. This is more a uh, Lobo comic book figure than it is a Lobo video game figure. So I'm really looking forward to that. The only thing that's missing for it for me is a space hog. <laughs> I really wish we got a Storm Collectible space hog, but mm-hmm. that would make for like a $200 figure. And yeah. last but not least, there is a possible reference to Lobo. I'm not sure if it's for sure, but I thought it was cool that uh, on a variant cover for an upcoming Cosmic Ghost Rider miniseries that they're doing, they have Cosmic Ghost Rider back facing towards the uh, the reader, and he's wearing a leather ja- a leather vest that has a back patch on it, very reminiscent of the Lobo's back cover mm-hmm. with the art by Simon Bisley with that famous Bite Me fanboy patch on the back. And as far as where you can find Lobo in your comics today, he is going to be heavily featured in the Tales of the Dark Multiverse Blackest Night coming up in about two weeks. Oh yeah, this is recorded on November 3rd. I probably should have led with that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, But yeah, he should be appearing in uh, Tales of the Dark Multiverse Blackest Night, featured very heavily along with a split personality Sinestro that has both the powers of a white and black lantern, a dove from Hawk and Dove, and Mr. Miracle. So I'm really looking forward to that. It's going to have art by Kyle Holtz, and it's written by Tim Seeley, who did one of my favorite miniseries of the past year, uh, Injustice vs. Masters of the Universe, because it's just like he really plays around with having the two hybrid and meet. And Lobo should be appearing in Teen Titans issue 36. Uh, If you are looking to catch up with Lobo on the Teen Titans, I highly recommend picking up Teen Titans issue 25, 31, 32, maybe 33 and 34 if you really want to bridge that gap between 32 and 35. But that's about all you really need to read to get a sense as to Lobo's role in this Teen Titans comic because we learn that he has a daughter named Crush who has been featured prominently as a member of the Teen Titans and we're going to see it all come to a head once again in Teen Titans issue 36. So that's Lobo's new Lobo news. Anything you want to add, Taylor? I know that we've spoken about uh, the Teen Titans and you know how his that's what introduces daughter, right? This yeah. latest new Teen Titan. 
And, uh... By Adam Glass. <clears throat> so, in... Because I haven't really been up to date on that, does it really include Lobo frequently, or does he just kind of pop in and out? Not very frequently. Lobo first meets Crush in Teen Titans 31 and 32, and that's where they first, like, have a confrontation with each other. I mentioned issue 25 because that goes into Crush's origin as to why she has a grudge against Lobo. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it has to do with the idea that she grew up believing that she was kind of like this Superman type character, Mm -hmm. where she was sent by an alien race to protect the planet and that's Mm. what her hippie parents sort of raised her to believe and then (laughs) she sees someone who looks like her fighting Superman as a villain Mm -hmm. and that of course is Lobo so for her it was just like this shattering of her belief in herself then we see them fight for the first time in 31 and 32 Uh, it's still kind of left up in the air as to who Crush's mother is Uh, I have my Mm -hmm. own theories about that, but if we ever get to the point where we cover more on Crush, uh, I'll get into that later. I'll just say this. I hope it's not Harley Quinn, because Harley (laughs) Quinn has way too much going on. Mm Mm-hmm. I gotta clear this because uh, how do you say it? Czarnian. Czarnian. Just Czarnian. Czarnian. Okay. So we got another Czarnian. We have another Czarnian running around. Okay. Unless this is something that connects into Rebels back before Rebirth and New Fifty Two, mm-hmm. uh, where we find out Zarnians were starting to be cloned from DNA that's just been left all over the place. Uh, but <laughs> that's a whole other thing for another podcast and for me to actually <laughs> read those comics. Uh-huh. That's our news. On to the comic reviews. We're starting off with Omega Men number three. This is all just very awkwardly flowing together, (laughs) I have to say. Uh Uh-huh. So who are these Omega Men? (laughs) So I'll tell you who the Omega Men are, because I'm sure many of you don't know. It was a comic team that was created by Marv Wolfman, and uh, their series was written by Roger Slifer, one of the co-creators of Lobo, and Keith Giffen, along with... Uh, Mike DiCarlo did a lot of the art for the books. But as for a brief intro to the Omega Men, they're a group of freedom integral of... Sorry, let me re, let me read back that. A brief intro into the Omega Men. A group of intergalactic freedom fighters led by Primus and his wife Callista, the Queen of Euphorix, together with Tigor, Demonia, Brute, and many other members from various species and planets that have been oppressed by the Citadel. They fight to free the Vega system. That is, if they can stop fighting amongst themselves. As for where Omega Men issue 3, Lobo's first appearance, picks up, we open on Euphorix, the last free planet of the Vega system, at home of Omega Man Callista. The supreme leader of the Citadel has been trying to bomb Euphorix to break through its impenetrable planet-wide force field. After yet another embarrassing failed attempt, the leader is visited by a peculiar space-traveling human, Harry Hockham, who offers the Citadel a plan. Cut to the former Citadel outpost on Planet Slag, now base of operations for the Omega Men. Primus and Tigor are off-world to enlist the help of Brute's people on Shangri Lin, leaving Callista to watch over the base. A Citadel transmission is received, announcing the evasion of Euphorix has begun. Images of Euphorixian cities inflamed are broadcasted, believing that if she acts now, the invasion can be stopped. She enlists the help of any Omega Man willing and able to join her on the mothership and save Euphorix. With Primus off-world and many believing Tigor to be better suited as leader, Callista can only get the, the lanky, cowardly Schlagen the mutated blue-feathered sister of Demonia Harpus, and a handful of others loyal to Primus and Callista to join her on this expedition. Schlagen voices his concern that this could be a citadel trap. Callista, on the other hand, is confident that the images that she saw of Euphoric's attack cannot be faked, and orders Harpus to light-speed warp <laughs> to Euphoric, despite Harpus warning her that rematerializing into debris could be dangerous. They take the risk and rematerialize into an asteroid near Euphorix. Almost all the ship's systems are wrecked, all but the ship's basic life support system. Callista was able to protect her crew using her powers as a sorceress, and a grateful Schlagen is sent to inspect the damage to the ship's hull. Schlagen, 
Donnie in a spacesuit exits the protective field of the ship and finds a grotesque fleshy sack dun, dun, dun. lodged into the ship's hole. Afraid of staying out of the ship for too long, Schlagen chooses to examine the sack inside the ship. He finds it warm to the touch, and with a poke, it begins to bleed, startling Schlagen out into open space once more. Meanwhile, back on Slag, Primus and Tigor return with, with no new recruits, and two less Omega men, Brute and Nimbus. Primus notices Callista's absence, and Tigor mocks not blaming her for leaving. Back on the mothership, Callista's crew managed to get the monitors up and running, but Schlagen's absence has not gone unnoticed. The lights flicker, but the monitor shows the generators are working fine. Callista gets Humbeck, exiled Citadel political cartoonist, to go check the engine room. When the disgruntled Humbeck arrives, he finds the room has been infested with graflings, flying manta ray-like creatures that feed on energy. They were incubating in the sack Schlagen brought onto the ship, and now eat their way through the hull to feast on the power cords of the ship. Shooing his way through the engine room, Humbeck finds Schlagen just barely in the ship's protective field. He calls on him to help, but Schlagen can't move. Something, or someone has him as a pair of purple hands force Schlagen out of his suit, and a voice from beyond the field asks, Is this yours? The frightened Humbeck watches as three figures step through the field, Bedlam, a space cowboy holding a robot named Berserk, the last, clad in purple and orange, clutching a still-breathing Schlagen in his hand, is the main man we'll come to know as Lobo. As a thank you, to the one-man greeting party, Lobo flicks Humbeck's funny-looking nose. The cartilage goes back into his brain, and his brain just goes back. Humbeck has drawn his last cartoon. Schlagen begs for his life as Lobo orders Berserk to kill him if he moves, and tells Bedlam to rendezvous on the bridge. Bedlam wagers that the first to get there gets two-thirds of the bounty, and the rest to whoever has the highest kill count. The Graflanes get to the main power line, and the lights go out, leaving Lobo in the dark with red eyes and a grin. Callista and Harpus on the bridge are alerted of the power outage and make attempts to reach security and warn the other nameless Omega men on board. The warning falls on dead ears as Bedlam has already taken out four of the crew. Lobo gets one. Harpus, unable to contact anyone on the starboard corridor, recognizes that whatever is on the ship is making its way to her and Callista. She makes her call and flies out to face whatever threat it is head on, despite Callista's ordering otherwise, leaving the Queen of Euphorics seemingly alone. And a voice comes from behind her. Psst. Hey, babe. Wanna dance? Lobo says from behind. Harpus catches up with Bedlam in a failed attempt to lunge out at him. She can only grasp his hat, which Bedlam rigged to detonate, blowing up her hands. Not satisfied with a wounded prey, Bedlam decides to tear off her wings as a souvenir. Callista appears to be faring better against Lobo, trapping him in her magic aura that is growing stronger and brighter as Lobo taunts her until the energy and light given off by her powers acts as a beacon, summoning all the Graflings on board to feast off her. Surrounded and weakened, Callista is eventually smothered and trapped beneath the Graflings, just as Lobo planned. Bedlam arrives to the bridge too late. Lobo has already has their quarry. He may be good, but he just wasn't the best. True to his word, Schlagen didn't move, and is left as a survivor of the assault. Lobo and Bedlam collect their bounty from a Citadel ship, where everything has gone to Harry Hokum's plan. The Citadel just had to pick the right hunters. Pleased with the results, the Citadel's supreme leader enlists Hokum as an advisor and leaves Callista's interrogation to him. Callista awakes in a strange cell, alone, and there she is greeted by a projection of Harry Hokum. The invasion of Euphorix was all a ploy to get either her or Primus in the Citadel's hands. Euphorix is fine, its force field intact. The images Callista saw from the broadcast were constructed from stolen memories of a native. Memories stolen using a Grishagurt, a grotesque, tendrilled beast that many thought extinct. It feasts and absorbs on the powers and features and mind of its prey, 
and to learn Euphorix's secrets, one is led into Callista's cell. The ensuing battle breaks the hull of the Citadel ship, with Callista and the Grishagurt atop the Euphorix force field, but well, once its tendrils get to Callista, the battle is over, and we're left with the haunting image of a distorted, drained Callista atop the planet she swore to protect. And that is Omega Man no number three. So, what did you think about the comic, Taylor? This was the first time that you've read an Omega Man comic, mm -hmm. just yeah. period. <clears throat> this is also the first Omega Man comic I ever read. Not the first time I've read this issue. Yeah. What, what are your thoughts on this issue? That was a good summary, by the way. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I actually really liked how you summarized each scene. Yeah. Because uh, it was putting new words to, like, what I was thinking, and that's kind of how... I can explain, you know, my thoughts is like my reaction to it. I didn't think Omega Man was going to get like that intense. <laughs> yeah, that um, intense that quick. It, it really got intense really quickly. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, if you're reading the book and like, you know, the art definitely does like play its part because just the small things and the big things that happen, like, you know, as soon as Lobo arrives, the first person that he kills, yeah, he just flicks him, he just but it flicks shows him. his whole brain just, like, yeah. being chucked out the back of his head. And, and then they, they kind of had to play <clears throat> fast and loose with it because, of course, the Comics mm -hmm. Code Authority was active at this time, so they couldn't, like, literally show brains getting mm -hmm. flying out. Yeah. But the captions play their part as well, but you just see the use of, like, the swoosh effect, and it sort of, like, goes into this weird Kirby crackle uh -huh. red, and it, you get the point as yeah. to what's going on. Yeah. And that's something that I love about the art in this book. There's mm -hmm. all these little details, and they really know how to play around in the medium. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, one of my favorite little bits is that there's actually something with Schlagen when he's uh, telling Callista uh, it could be a trap on Euphorix. You notice on the panel where we cut to Schlagen, there's this little like swoosh going up from uh, his mouth to his antenna, mm -hmm. which implies that he's been sucking on his droopy antenna. <laughs> Uh -huh. <laughs> it's like a little I'm guessing that's like a little nervous habit of him and Schlagen yeah. a lot of you probably don't know because who knows who Schlagen is uh -huh. uh, is like this tall lanky yellow alien and he just looks sad like you look at him he's just sad uh -huh. <laughs> it's like an ostrich of a man uh, and he has this droopy antenna so I thought that was really cool uh, yeah I, I, I definitely like the subtleties like that when artists can uh, just kind of include that in each scene yeah so like even looking at the cover i really like the cover because like you don't know who this guy is lobo at, no. you know before you get into it but like he really does just like out class you know the omega man once he shows up oh absolutely and he you know gets his his bounty yeah he and bedlam they just completely <laughs> obliterate once they get on sh on board actually once uh, Schlagen finds the Graffling uh, egg sack, it all sort of, like, goes from this sci-fi epic into, like, a horror movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because it's, like, this impending thing coming after him. And mm -hmm. Bedlam and Lobo are treated almost like this force, this inevitable thing that's going to get them. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's really good. And I, I, love, I love the art, just the random sci-fi stuff in the background. Things look computery and the use mm -hmm. of lighting. Uh... A proper use of shadows like just that image of Lobo with his with a grin and red eyes in the dark ah mm -hmm. oh, it's it's so good yeah and usually so like in this issue uh Primus isn't there right he's like elsewhere no. and so Kalista is like the acting Kalista leader. is acting as leader. and and so like in the end you're thinking like oh yeah you know they're not gonna really like get the leader and no, things are gonna turn gonna out okay but she's ending up in a cell and like is just getting the life sucked out of her. <laughs> Absolutely. So. And uh, I, I did, uh, for this podcast, I did read uh, issues one and two and a mm -hmm. little bit of four of Omega Men. Spoiler alert, Callista does survive because random comic book stuff. Oh, Darn. Darn. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that would have been... But I was left... The first time I read this, uh, this was before the DC Universe app launched. So mm -hmm. the only Omega Men comic I had was Omega Men number three, and mm -hmm. I didn't have any access to any other of the Omega Men comics. Mm -hmm. And I only read the other Omega Men comics once DC Universe came out. And I'm on issue four. I just started issue four. 
uh, just to find out what happens to Callista. And I thought it would have been interesting if, like, for the rest of the series, we have this Grisha Gert that's posing as Callista be a <laughs> member of the team. Yeah. But no, that's not the case. Uh, somebody on Euphoric says, what's that thing on our force field? And opens it up and it's like, oh, my God, our queen. Uh-huh. Yeah, and so. <laughs> they rescue Callista. Like, we talked a little bit before the podcast, right? And I think this is one that really... So issue number three really does stand alone really well. Oh, yeah. And uh, because, you know, I hadn't read one or two or four. I just jumped in and it, you know, it builds its own context. Mm -hmm. But it does make me want to know what happens after because I didn't know it was going to be that intense. But, like, it has a lot going on, a lot of moving parts Mm -hmm. to the story. And so uh, it made me, yeah, want to read more Omega Men. There are a lot of moving parts to this. And something Mm -hmm. that I really love about it. Uh, is sort of like the same thing that I think makes a lot of the original Star Wars movies really good, is that you just mm-hmm. get these like weird, unique-looking alien creatures, mm-hmm. and they don't explain them at all. They're just there, and right. it just adds this sort of life to the world, mm-hmm. uh, especially because the Omega Men is supposed to be this group that's composed of all these different races that have been conquered by the Citadel. Uh-huh. And, uh, yeah, so, like, you have people like Schlagen who look completely different than uh, Humbeck, who's, like, this butt-headed troll-looking dude. Mm-hmm. And uh, then you have uh, another one, Verstral, who's, like, this bug-eyed little guy who shows up on the bridge. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, what do you think about it as far as a Lobo appearance? So I read this after reading The Justice League of America, which is a more modern take on Lobo. Yeah, which uh, is one of the more later appearances of Lobo. Uh-huh. And so there had already been decades of, you know, establishing, like, this this kind of persona that he carries. Yeah. And so in Omega Man 3, yeah, he's, he's like, a you know, like, working well with someone else yeah. uh, to begin with. So, like, <laughs> it's not like he's just... Uh, he's working with Bedlam and Berserk, and uh, they're yeah. actually, like, recurring characters in the Omega uh-huh. Men series. Like, I think Lobo's had seven or eight appearances throughout the series. Mm-hmm. So yeah. him not, like, throwing shade at the guy he's working with or, yeah. like, you know, saying any of his, like, you know, famous quotes or like words. Like, frag or, or Clyde or Bastich uh-huh. or ornery or trib or kill ren destroy uh-huh. frag or fetal's giz or <laughs> exactly swag or yeah exactly so he he did seem more like put together as like he can work well with others yeah. and he, he's this uh, mercenary that you know actually is like articulate and yeah he doesn't have any of his vocabulary uh-huh which is one thing that's important to note. He doesn't have his biker jacket. <laughs> yeah. He does have a space bike, but it looks nothing like the space hog that we mm-hmm. know and love or the space frag. Yeah, and his hair looks like clown hair. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the, just <clears throat> visually he's very yeah. different too. His face his face markings aren't as prominent as they are when Simon Bisley draws the care draws mm-hmm. the character so it's really it's really weird but i i do feel like this is a comic that's worth for any lobo fan any lobo fan worth their giz mm-hmm. should have this comic uh simply so that way they know where the character comes from but one thing that i do think is still present in lobo in this very early appearance is well yes he does work pretty well with bedlam and berserk he's almost like the leader of them which is sort of what we established. He's barking orders to Bedlam and Berserk, and he also still sort of, like, taunts and jokes with them. Like, that bit I put in when Bedlam shows up, that's actually Mm -hmm. something Lobo tells Bedlam. Like, Bedlam, you may be good, but you're just not the best. Mm -hmm. He's taunting him. And when he's with uh, Callista, he lets her believe that she has the upper hand, but Mm -hmm. he's taunting her the whole way through. He makes Uh a remark about, like, oh, you're glowing. You're like a beacon. This must have been how you've been when you first lost your... (gasps) If you ever lost your innocence, mm-hmm. uh, some, something along those lines. And issues one and two make it very clear that Callista has lost her innocence to Primus. Uh-huh. Very clear. <laughs> those two be fucking. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, Lobo still sort of like taunts people, but he doesn't have like, his tough guy persona is kind of there, but it's not really there yeah you uh, s- you still get like a feel so like when you were as you were reading i uh 
you know that that's what kind of strikes the same note as like the newer version of Lobo is like as soon as he was approaching Kalista like in yeah. the dark and you know all he says is uh, hey babe wanna <laughs> dance <laughs> yeah that is that's pretty classic yeah, Lobo yeah that, that's so. something kind of classic Lobo uh-huh. he, he likes to play with his food uh-huh. is the way I'd put it exactly yeah and uh <laughs> And boy, Callista was a dish during this issue. <laughs> uh-huh. uh, she got Lobo was preying on her. The Grisha Gert was preying on her. <laughs> Primus clearly does. Mm-hmm. But yeah, and uh, Omega Man, it, it's definitely worth reading it. Um, just just for the fun of it, like you said, it's a great one-off story, mm-hmm. and I think it gives a lot of background. But also like. Just read Omega Man if you're looking for a really cool sci-fi story. Uh, a lot of people kind of compare it to, like, DC's Guardians of the Galaxy. I I can kind of see that, but I, I don't know why. But, like, some of the other Guardians of the Galaxy books, especially after the movie came out, they don't quite click with me as well as this does because it's just so weird and unique and cool and... Yeah, Mm -hmm. and, like, there's these little things everywhere. Like, there's these little starfish creatures that you see talking to Schlagen Mm -hmm. that are in a pod. Those are actually, like, these symbiotic creatures that the Omega Men use to go onto other planets because they sort of adapt the person that's wearing them to the atmosphere that they're in. And the only thing that they ask in return is that they get to see the world. Mm -hmm. That's why they get to see the galaxy and the solar system. That's why they were begging Schlagen, like, no! take me take mm-hmm. me take but me schlagen was too cowardly I, even to bring yeah. little guys <laughs> schlagen is like i i prefer a spacesuit. i don't want something clinging on to me yeah <laughs> yeah but uh schlagen that that's a character i kind of hope that they bring back into some of the other dc stuff like it'd mm-hmm. be cool just to have schlagen as i don't know like a lobo side character like as an informant or something mm-hmm. and the only reason he's an informant is because every time lobo's around him he pisses his pants <laughs> Give, give him he's a so purpose. scared. He's like, I don't know what you love, what you want from me. Uh-huh. Give him some, some purpose. <laughs> give him some purpose. Like I, I, I think Schlagen should come back. Where is Schlagen Rebirth? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. For the yeah. Schlagen one, one uh-huh. shot. <laughs> mm-hmm. But yeah, uh, that's Omega Man issue three. I think it's a good, not even like a good intro to Lobo. I just think it's a good story on itself. Maybe not the best Lobo appearance, but definitely mm-hmm. a cool one for yeah. any hardcore, <laughs> hardcore fragging bastiches out there. That is Omega Men number three. And the mm-hmm. second comic that we're covering in, sort of like the format that I'm thinking about for these comic reviews, is that we cover one classic appearance and one modern appearance. So our modern appearance for this podcast is Justice League of America Annual 2017, number one, something or other, Electric Boogaloo, uh, written by Steve Orlando with art by Kelly Jones. Mm -hmm. So uh, go ahead and give your summary. So, yeah, this is like a one-shot also. So this is a story where Lobo recruits the other adult, as he discovers later the only other bastitch of the league, (laughs) uh, Black Canary. And uh, not being too fond of the idea of joining forces, Black Canary asks Lobo to recount exactly what he plans to do and why. He explains that he heard word about someone so evil, he's referring to them as the worst of the worst. Uh, For this is someone that is killing his beloved space dolphins, aka fishies. So Black Canary doesn't believe him and what his motives are, but ends up being the only person to ever see a side of Lobo she didn't think existed. A soft side. (gasps) (laughs) This issue has some really good humor, and I personally thought the way they use flashbacks was used really well. Uh, It just went right into the story. You discover some new things about Lobo, and although Lobo and Black Canary might initially seem like quite an unlikely pair, um, they both are pretty hard-headed individuals. They, They pull off the mission of taking down this bastich in a pretty badass way and this issue shows that Lobo really does have feelings at least for dolphins and then also you can't really forget that in this issue we find out that there is another remaining Zarnian Zarnian. Gusano Trib Mm -hmm. and so goes into that a bit (laughs) who did not exist pre Mm -hmm. uh, pre rebirth 
Uh, so, what were your overall feelings on the comic? Um, as as sort of like a Lobo newbie. Yeah, and so this was the first one I've read at least uh, in a long time of any Lobo. And, uh, Other so, than that one page on Superman. Uh-huh. I, I gotta point out the art, I guess, first. You know, it, it's it's a Lobo-focused comic. Yeah. And so, even though it's Justice League of America, like, looking at the cover, like, it looked a little wonky to me at first. Like, they're very, like, bulky. That's Kelly Jones' um, art, in uh-huh. a nutshell. Just very wonky. Yeah, and so at first I was like, I don't, I don't know, like, what this is really gonna entail. <laughs> But I think, like, as you go through the comic, it definitely does, like, serve its purpose. I'm really into the really cosmic-esque stuff in comics. And so, yeah. like, I thought the artist did an awesome job making, like, the space dolphin homeworld. Because oh, I don't, yeah, I don't know absolutely. if it's been shown before. Like, this is the first Not time it's been Not that I know right? of. I think this is the first appearance of Del Mar's Marzopa. Yeah, and so it, it really did have, like, this magical feel, and, like, that's really what you get from Lobo, is that these are magical creatures. <laughs> these are magical, um, pure creatures. <laughs> and I also didn't, uh, like, understand his connection with this, the space dolphins, because I knew about it before, but yeah. uh, apparently, like, according to this comic, he did, like, ex- exposure to them as when he was a kid. When he was a kid on Zarnia. Yeah, right. It was and like the first thing that looked at him without judgment in its eyes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's that's what I mean by like the the flashbacks worked really well with it because like in that same flashback, it's talking about his teacher Mrs. Trib, ends was... up tying in with like what happened after that and before this comic where like he blows up the the Zarnians. Yeah, well, there's a little bit more to the destruction uh-huh. of Zarnia than just blowing it up. Uh, it was actually a plague that he started. And this was actually a little touch that I appreciated from the show Krypton, mm-hmm. is that they oh. acknowledged the fact that the destruction of Zarnia wasn't just blowing it up. Mm-hmm. He created these sort of like flying scorpion creatures okay. <laughs> that would infect <laughs> Zarnians with mm-hmm. a disease that would ruin their uh, regenerative properties. Wow. So he basically killed them all off using a disease first, mm-hmm. then blew up the planet. Wow. Uh, so a lot of people forget that he's not just an engineer. He's a genetic engineer. Uh-huh. Uh, and that was something I appreciated from the Krypton show. But in this book, I, I do like the little flashback to Zarnia and seeing like Trib, which is a deep cut for Steve Orlando to bring into the to bring into this what I consider a more a Lobo one shot than a Justice League one shot mm-hmm. uh, because Trib was actually the last Zarnian escort that Lobo had the mission of escorting to the Legion headquarters in Lobo the Last Zarnian, that four-issue miniseries that I was talking about earlier as, like, the essential start for a Lobo fan. Mm -hmm. Miss Tribb, she wrote a book on Lobo called Mm -hmm. The Last Zarnian, and this is where you get a lot of, like, little little tidbits Mm -hmm. every now and then Mm -hmm. uh, in between the book. They kind of, like, did it, like, how Watchmen had those... uh, had those little cuts from uh, the first Night Owl's book, Under the Hood. Mm-hmm. That was sort of like what the Lazarian acted on there. And it was like pages taken out of her book where she talks about Lobo, how he was when he was born, how he was growing up as a child, oh, his yeah. connections in Legion and stuff like that. So Miss Trib is actually like a very significant character mm-hmm. to Lobo fans. And it was really cool to see her again. Uh, but they retcon a couple things that i had Mm. some feelings about Mm -hmm. yeah (laughs) like gusano just the existence of gusano trib and Uh i agree with you on is that kelly jones art in this book i love it when they do all the sci-fi the sci-fi background stuff like when they're traveling on hyperspace speed on the space frag Mm -hmm. as they call lobo space hog and i love the look of del marzopa and stuff like that. The one thing I don't like about the art, on occasions with when they look at Lobo's face, mm-hmm. the way they do his mustache, yeah, it's okay. kind of like gappy, and it's not. It looks like a five o'clock shadow sometimes. And it, whereas the mustache is sort of supposed to be like mm-hmm. a permanent fixture on his face, like yeah. it's part of his and face markings. I know it was kind of just to emphasize like emotion that they're you know experiencing when they're interacting, but it did yeah. seem like inconsistent also with it, the, the facial. It does seem very inconsistent. It's very. Uh-huh. I do like Kelly Jones' artwork for exaggerated features, but mm-hmm. I, I 
sometimes you need to make them look a little consistent. Mm-hmm. And uh, Lobo's eyes, they fill in, they do the whole black stuff around the eyes, but they don't do the little hooks on the side. Mm-hmm. Uh, which which kind of irked me as a Lobo fan, uh-huh. which is weird that a Lobo fan gets irked. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. But uh, still, I, I still think it's a very solid book. That that was the one thing about it. Mm-hmm. But it does also tie in a lot of stuff from uh, Justice League of America and Lobo's appearance since Rebirth. Because it explains why Lobo was on Earth in the first place during mm-hmm. the events of Justice League versus Suicide Squad. Mm-hmm. He received a, a space dolphin distress signal that led him to Amanda Waller, which led mm-hmm. to him joining Amanda Waller's Suicide Squad. Then eventually Lobo was freed, and then he joins the Justice League of America for Justice League of America Rebirth. Mm-hmm. And this is the second time in comics Lobo has joined the Justice League the third time overall that he's been a part of the Justice League. So he's working with Black Canary in this issue, and I didn't, I also don't know too much about Black Canary. Yeah. So uh, how do you think, like, how she was portrayed in this, like, bodes with... I think she's portrayed very well, because Mm -hmm. the thing, I like Black Canary as a biker chick. Mm -hmm. That's sort of why I like it when she's drawn with a short leather jacket and when she has the fishnets on and stuff like that so the mm-hmm. justice league of america black canary is right up my alley mm-hmm. because i do agree she's probably the only other bastitch on the team she's like a no hold bars just mm-hmm. like sort of a tough girl mm-hmm. i do kind of like uh kind of like black canary's portrayal in this especially like the way how she how she responds to buck taz shit <laughs> where she actually recognizes uh-huh. Oh, so you're just, it's a screw job. You're screwing someone over. Yeah, that's exactly what she said. (laughs) Uh, It's really interesting. But, yeah, this uh, comic actually gives us a bit of a look into other Zarnians and Zarnian culture, and this is Mm -hmm. kind of a retcon, where Zarnians in this book are depicted just as crazy as Lobo. Mm -hmm. Like, Gusano Trib actually uses some of Lobo's vocabulary like frag and when he gets exposed to the canary cry he says mother bastitch <laughs> which that is a voice i i think fits gusano trib yeah uh <laughs> he should be like a pompous ass uh, <laughs> yeah and like you said uh more to add to their culture what was the ritual or the tradition buck that... taz shit buck taz shit and i actually wrote down what it is that one zarnian's responsibility <laughs> and actions can be put upon another with or without consent. Mm -hmm. So if Lobo beats uh, Gusano Trib, or if he uh, assigns someone to fight Gusano Trib for him, if that person loses that fight, they become responsible for all of Lobo's actions. If uh, they beat Gusano Trib, Gusano Trib becomes responsible for all of Lobo's actions. Which Black Canary beats Gusano Tribs with Lobos and the Space Dolphins' help. Hmm. Where Gusano Trib becomes, since he is a Zarnian and he can regenerate, he becomes like an endless source of food for the Space Dolphins yeah. for centuries to come. I thought that was really interesting, actually. Yeah, uh, that, that was really cool and really gruesome. Uh-huh. But, uh, yeah, the use of Black Canary is very interesting because uh, Steve Orlando kind of establishes in his Justice League of America run that Zarnians are weak to the Canary Cry because the sonic sound messes mm-hmm. with their regenera- regenerative properties, which mm-hmm. is part of why Lobo recruits uh, Black Canary, even though he had no way of knowing that the billowy doolop Gusano Trib was going to be who they had to fight against. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that that's one thing that did bug me, were the retcons of Zarnians being just as crazy as Lobo, because uh, part of Lobo's origin originally was that he was outcasted from Zarnia because he wasn't peaceful, because he was insane. Mm. And he was like, you know what, enough of this shit, I'm just going to kill all of you. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what he did. I thought those were kind of like needless retcons. But I guess Legion doesn't exist in this iteration of the DC universe, so there was no way for them to go, oh, Lobo delivers a trib to Vril Dox, who he was working for at the time. And that, and then like once he was delivered safely into Vril's hands, that was the end of the contract. So that's when he killed Trib. <laughs> <laughs> because he no longer had to honor the contract that was just fulfilled. But I do like the way uh, Lobo is portrayed. Uh, maybe not a big fan of the art on some cases, on some faces. 
I do like that uh, Lobo Frequence of Bar called the Heaven's Undercarriage, which for <laughs> any eagle-eyed uh, readers out there, there's a hidden midnighter in the Heaven's Undercarriage. Mm-hmm. So keep an eye out for that. <laughs> Thinking back to when we were viewing Omega Men 3, <clears throat> you mentioned that subtlety with Schlegan, right? Yeah, with um, Schlegan. And as if like he had been sucking on his own antenna. Like, uh, at some point during Justice League of America, um, when they're entering the, the homeland of the Space Dolphins, you know, Lobo's distracted by the beauty. Yeah. And so they actually... He's just looking around. <laughs> they actually get shot down. Yeah. Right? And so, like, you know there's this wreckage with his bike, um, but on the way to the homeland, uh, Black Canary had to wear a space helmet. Yeah. And so on the very last page, um, you know, it says, like, dolphin saved or... You know, something yeah. along those lines, and uh, it shows Black Canary got her helmet back on, they're ready to go, but it has a patch. Yeah, like, on the shield. it's like duct taped together. Yeah, it's like duct taped together. And I just, I thought that was funny because that, that is a good touch. <laughs> it just brings it. That was something. That, now that you mention it, uh, that that's something else that's interesting is that one thing I do, I did appreciate about this book is that they do take a moment to talk about Lobo as an engineer. Mm-hmm. Uh, right. How he built this, how he built the space frag himself, and yeah. uh, how the space frag it has like this invisible gravity field on it. That's part of why they just don't go flying out into space whenever they're riding on it. Yeah, and Black Canary just kind of says, "Oh, well, you do have more potential." Like I, potential. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he gets offended because it's like all he's ever lived with was talking people talking about his potential, mm-hmm. <laughs> and then he killed them all. Uh, <laughs> Uh, this is a good read, definitely. If you like, uh, if you're looking for a Lobo one shot, like a recent Lobo one shot, this is a book you should pick up. If you're looking for a Justice League one shot, skip it. If you're a Lobo fan, you'll love it. If you're not that big into Lobo, you're not gonna like it as much. One thing I was going to say is that I forgot that I wanted us to do was that we were actually going to rate our books. So how would you rate Omega Men number three out of five space dolphins? What would you rate? <laughs> oh, man. I actually really liked it. So since I don't have, like, a whole collection of Lobo to compare it to, just, like, comics around that time period, I, I think it really does hold up pretty well. So, like, probably a four space dolphins. Four space dolphins out of five? That's mm-hmm. good. Yeah. That's good. For me, it's for me, it's the same thing. It's a good four Space Dolphins out of five. I appreciate mm-hmm. it like as a comic itself. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not a great Lobo appearance, but it is his first appearance, mm-hmm. and it does establish some stuff with the character right off the bat. Yeah. He sort of taunts people. He's very intelligent. He's very strategic. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that was something I really loved about it, and it's still like a good read. Mm-hmm. And it's actually something that got me wanting to collect more Omega Men, that I'm actually starting to actually track some of them down and try to buy them and, all myself. And this issue was written by uh, Marv Wolfman? This was or... written by Roger Slifer. Oh, okay. uh, Marv Wolfen, Wolfman <coughs> created the team, mm-hmm. but the team first appeared in uh, Teen Titans, I believe, and then they had a second appearance in Green Lantern, and then they got their own series, which lasted 38 issues, mm-hmm. gotcha. uh, which is a solid run for, like, a... C team in the 80s and 90s mm-hmm. really saw it. And you get a bunch of like cool creatures in there like Tigor and Brute. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, so we didn't really get to see what they can do, but... No, no you don't, uh, but like in some of the other books you do, and mm-hmm. they're pretty cool. Uh, but yeah, Omega Men, solid four space dolphins out of five. I still need to track down the rest of the physical books, but for now I'll just read them on the DC Universe app. Because uh, they're all there. And uh, Justice League Annual 2017. How many Space Dolphins out of five would you rate that? It was really entertaining to me. <laughs> so, like, entertainment value was really high. But it wasn't, like, necessarily my kind of comic. But oh, okay. I, it definitely was, like, a page-turner, though. I still really enjoyed it. So, yeah, like, probably... it definitely got you cracking up. Yeah, I liked both books. But uh, this one, I think, <clears throat> like, I'm more of a traditionalist, I guess, with the writing. So this is probably, like, a 3.5. 3.0, 3.5 space. Why would you split a space dolphin in half? <laughs> well, they're the most precious thing in the universe. Every every part of the dolphin is valuable, so half of it is still got some weight to it. Is so, it the top half or the bottom half? I have to know. Let's go with the bottom half. <laughs> the bottom half, so you don't have its cold, dead eyes yeah, staring back at exactly. you with a single dolphin tear going. I can't why have would that you on my conscience. <laughs> 
So 3.25. I uh, give this a 3 out of 5. Okay. So you uh, I I still enjoy it. I don't hate mm-hmm. it, but I also don't and you know what? No, 4 4 out of 5 because it's still for me, mm-hmm. this was like the book that got me going. You know what? I got to read the rest of Steve Orlando's Justice League of America because this guy gets it. And doesn't uh, Orlando usually do like horror? I don't know what he usually does. I mm-hmm. know uh, he's done a uh, twelve issue maxi series for Martian Manhunter that I think is just wrapping up. Hmm. Uh, I've read some of that, and that has some more like horror elements to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I don't know about the rest of his work. He oh, also okay. has done a new f- run of Freedom Fighters. For DC Comics, you know, that group of Uncle Sam, the Human Mm -hmm. Bomb, and the Doll, and the Phantom Lady. Uh, (laughs) But yeah, this is a a 4 out of 5, because this was the one that got me wanting to pick up more Justice League of America. I have the whole microverse, Assault on the Microverse, or Invasion of the Microverse, whatever the microverse thing was. And I have the one that they brought in, Prometheus, and it's kind of okay. I When Lobo isn't there, it's boring to me. Because <laughs> I'm really yeah. just reading it for Lobo. He has a presence. He does have a presence. He in it. He's the <laughs> asshole big brother of the group, and that's, that's exactly what I think he should be on a Justice League team. Mm-hmm. But shout out to the the DC app. I really liked how because I use it on my phone. I don't know if you use it on your phone. I do use it on my um, phone. You can literally it's just. It's really not available anywhere else. Oh okay, but you just tap this, or you could zoom in, and then it goes frame by frame and yeah. moves along as if like the speech is happening. Yeah. You know, that order. It's really cool. Um, so I really like the fluidity and like ease of the DC Universe app. This yeah. was like your first time using it, right? Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, those are our comic reviews for it. And to sort of like spice things up from the usual comic podcast uh, standard, and since this is a Lobo podcast, I came up with a, sec- a segment reminiscent Bane Mary Kill, or f- Fuck Mary Kill. Who cares uh-huh. about censorship? <laughs> This is a Lobo podcast. It should be intended for mature this, readers only. This is not sponsored by Disney. So. No, it is not. Because this isn't a Marvel podcast, <laughs> goddammit. Exactly. But I call it Kill, Rin, Destroy, or Frag. And uh, who's on the chopping block today? We have... Rom Space Knight. Wave Rider. Lockjaw. And Jack of Hearts. So, just to establish how this works... Kill means a character that we would kill off, either because it would make for an interesting story or simply because we like their appearances in comics, but it's time for them to go away. Rend would be, we want to see them injured, absent for a time, come back a little later. Destroy means we want them deleted from the universe. And frag means we just want to mess with them. We just want to see them played around with more. So, Taylor, Mm -hmm. I'll let you... uh, start us off of these four that cosmic characters that we have on the chopping block today Mm -hmm. who would you kill who would i kill and this is for them to come back later right kill is that they've been around for a while but you don't want to see them anymore (sighs) gotcha like you want to keep all of their appearances that have existed there they still have existed in this universe but they should they should go away i think everything uh with rom is perfect as is yeah just got to kill him. Just got to kill him. <laughs> well, Marvel no longer has the rights to him, so that's so he, safe. So he has been killed. As far as his appearance in the Marvel comics, you're good. Uh-huh. Okay. <laughs> so then he is killed. <laughs> uh, but IDW has been doing comics with him, so if you want him to go away from IDW for now. <laughs> yeah, that, that's what I mean. Just put an end to, to the Rom, continuation the Rom of franchise. Rom. Yeah, of Rom the Space. <laughs> Hasbro doesn't even make Rom toys anymore. <laughs> Oh, man. Who would you kill? I would kill... I would kill Lockjaw. Poor Lockjaw. Why poor Lockjaw? Because I love Lockjaw. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. But I think it would be really cool if we were to... They kind of did it in Death of the Inhumans, but Donny Cates was too much of a wuss to put Lockjaw... (laughs) To euthanize Lockjaw forever. (laughs) So I see where you're going with this. I was... That was my first thought. Yeah. Kill Lockjaw. But Lockjaw, I think they should kill him off simply because uh, something that else that Donny Cates establishes in Death of the Inhumans mm-hmm. is that uh, Lockjaw and Beta Ray Bill 
are gr- are good friends. They're very uh-huh. close good friends, and we saw a bit of Beta Ray's Bill's vengeance for Lockjaw mm-hmm. and Death of the Inhumans. So, but now I kind of want to see yeah. what happens if we really kill Lockjaw. To see is... how bonkers Beta Ray Bill would get. This is true. Yeah. So. So it's simply because I think it would be make for a great story mm-hmm. if we kill off Lockjaw. But yeah, that's uh. That's for me. Who would you rent? Someone that you want to sort of like injure, make them go away for a while, and then eventually bring them back. The mystery is kind of what got me into him in the first place, but I want to see more out of Jack of Hearts. You want to see more out of Jack of Hearts. So I feel like he already kind of has been suspended for some time. He has been and suspended, and he hasn't been back since. Yeah, because the latest appearance I've seen of him was in Silver Surfer, I think. Silver Surfer, and which year of Silver Surfer? This was in the 80s. I believe Jack of Hearts was in a 2000s comic. I forget which mm-hmm. one. But he did get, like, a weird modern version of him, but they killed him off shortly later. Jack of Hearts just looks weird. I don't know how you can make it work. <laughs> yeah, and I think there would have to be an adaptation to his whole costume. Yeah. Uh, because he does have this really, like cheesy old school like look going for him yeah you know oh his name's jack of hearts let's make him have a heart on his eye and <laughs> look like it. he's on a damn playing card yeah. but you know like i always felt like he was the hero's hero mm-hmm. um like so in that issue that i was referring to like in the silver surfer this was when um tyrant he like captured better bill surfer jack of hearts you know hard-hitting dudes and it was Jack of Hearts that, you know, like, freed him. He, like, gave it everything he got. He was trying to sacrifice himself. But I think he lived in the end. But yeah. he, like, you know, he's always trying to be the hero. Yeah. Like, in his first um, limited, you know, four-issue series, that's what he did was, like, plunge himself into the sun, right? Mm-hmm. That's what happened. <laughs> I, I don't, I, I don't I, know. I didn't actually, read Jack of Hearts. <laughs> I actually, uh, it's a little fuzzy for me. But, yeah, either way, he, he's, he's always sacrificing himself for the people. I like people that are, or characters that are truly trying to be a hero, like him especially, because he was, like, going to kill himself, mm-hmm. off himself off, because he doesn't know how to handle or cope with, like, his power and all that. Then he, you know, found a purpose for himself. Yeah. Something else I probably should have led with this edition of Kill, Ren, Destroy, Frag is that the theme for these characters is cosmic. So these are all characters with cosmic powers or have appeared in cosmic books. Mm-hmm. So that's that's a good choice. Jack of Hearts, bring him back for a bit after a long absence. That would be good. I'm not sure if it'll be a triumphant return, but it, it could be an interesting <laughs> return. Uh-huh. I'd like to see how they try to modernize his costume, if they even do that. Just that would be interesting. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, they could try to make him look like the Impact Comics age of Blackjack, or Jack of... Blackjack? I think it was Blackjack. Uh, who would I rent? I would rend Rom Space Knight. Mm -hmm. I would injure him in one of his comics. I don't even know how the IDW run is going. I haven't read any of the IDW run. I don't know if they have the ability to use any of Rom's supporting cast from the Marvel comics. Just to be honest, I am low-key a little bit of a Rom Space Knight fan, Mm -hmm. uh, simply because it's one of those weird comics that just existed for some reason. And it was still, like, very interesting and very sci-fi. It's a little bit like how Omega Men is. It's, like, sci-fi in some of the best ways. Yeah, and some big-time characters pop in and out in Rom. Oh, yeah, a lot of big-time characters. There was actually a huge, huge fight that involved, like, the Marvel characters mm -hmm. and the X-Men, the Avengers, the X-Men, the Fantastic Four. All of them, like, helped Rom fight off the dire wraiths. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it's insane. Yeah, but, Galactus yeah. makes appearances. Yep, and... Galactus makes appearances. Rom was made like a huge part of the Marvel cosmic landscape. Mm-hmm. Uh, so much so that like Marvel had to do something with the Space Knights. So they started a limited team called the Space Knights. Uh, but they couldn't make reference to Rom other than like a statue that appears in the background. Mm-hmm. But yeah, Rom Space Knight, I don't know how the IDW series is going. But I don't even know if it's ongoing. But I would like to see it if they were to put him away for a bit and take, like, another character from Rom's supporting cast, 
I forget exactly what her name was, but she was like the yellow space knight. Uh, kind of looks like Arya from Killer Instinct. Hmm. She would eventually like sort of turn dark, but I think if they were to do that dark turn, if they haven't done that dark turn yet, I really should have read some ROM IDW before I started talking and opening my fat mouth, but here we go. <laughs> but I would like to see it if she were to sort of take over the series from ROM for a bit, sort of help build up her fan base, once Rom comes back, that's when the turn happens, and that's where we start to see her go down this dark path, and mm-hmm. that's when it becomes like almost this tragedy. Mm-hmm. So I think that would be interesting. Give Rom a little time to breathe, and then bring him back triumphantly. Why don't you just take on uh, writing for this? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to write comics. I just know how to read them. Now's the time to start. Yeah, I guess so. Now, <laughs> now is the time to start. Anyway... <laughs> Who would you destroy, Taylor? Who would you just delete from the universe? Just get rid of them. Um, make, make it so that way they never existed. Well, so we were talking about just comics before this started, yeah. and uh, I didn't. I, I think I know who Wave Rider is, but I, I think there's features of him in a lot of my comics, but it, he didn't make big enough of a mark for no. me to remember it. No, he never so does. So I don't think... Erasing him would make too big an impact on those story arcs, <laughs> uh, because I I, I I could see him like in the background flying with his fiery head, but <laughs> like if he just poof, you know, just if he just poof, even like his essence, I don't think would make an impact. No, <laughs> so. I don't think so either. Other than Armageddon two thousand, which was the series he was created for. Uh-huh. I don't think he would make such a big impact. The yeah. reason I'm laughing so much about this is because he's also my pick to destroy. Oh. <laughs> well, great. <laughs> For very similar reasons. That, yeah. like, there's already, like, five or seven other time-traveling characters in the DC landscape. You don't need Wave Rider. At yeah. least you don't need Wave Rider as he exists in the DC comics as a time-traveler. Mm-hmm. A version of Wave Rider could exist. They did something kind of interesting where Wave Rider is like an alternate version of Booster Gold. And mm-hmm. I thought that was kind of cool mm-hmm. for like a one shot story or like a what if. But most people know Wave Rider from Legends of Tomorrow, not as a character, but as the name of a ship. <laughs> it is the uh-huh. Wave Rider. And yeah. I always thought what would be an interesting arc is instead of having Wave Rider as a as like a different superhero or character, uh, the AI on the Wave Rider of Legends of Tomorrow gets a physical form, uh-huh. and that becomes the Wave Rider superhero. Yeah. But you don't need. I don't think the Wave Rider that exists in DC Universe needs to exist. Mm-hmm. It's time traveling Silver Surfer. Yeah. That's about it. If there's a hardcore Wave Rider fan that's like, <laughs> what the hell, man? I'm sorry, but yeah. he's he's Silver Surfer Firestorm. Mm-hmm. You don't need him. I don't think he needs to exist. <laughs> yeah. In fact, like any of the pre-existing time travel characters could have done what he did in Armageddon, where he comes back in time to stop like the monarch from existing, who turns out to be Hank Hall, even though it was originally planned to be Captain Adam, and that's a whole thing in itself. <laughs> yeah. Which which we have another character like Captain Adam that exists. We do. Uh, He's kind of like Dr. Manhattan. The guy, Captain Adam <laughs> is a little different than Dr. Manhattan. He? he became more Dr. Manhattan-y in uh, New 52, mm. but for me, the pinnacle captain adam is sort of like the justice league international captain adam or the uh Mm. justice league unlimited captain adam where he's a good soldier that happens to work with the justice league Mm, okay uh where he's a soldier first and a superhero second Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. anyway we're we were talking about wave rider not captain adam (laughs) wave rider doesn't need to exist destroy him introduce a wave rider ship but don't have wave rider the character and then maybe turn gideon into a wave rider Mm -hmm. uh, a female wave rider that'd be that'd be pretty cool and oddly Mm -hmm. oddly attractive (laughs) and then it could be crush's mother (laughs) (laughs) that that would be a little more unique yeah it would be it'd be different it'd be different so who would you like to frag someone you would like to mess with that's a good question um Gonna go with Lockjaw. I mean, I think I would use Lockjaw yeah. to frag other people. To frag other people. So you because, would play around with Lockjaw. Yeah, he has the ability to to teleport uh-huh. like great lengths, right? 
you want to see him play around more. Yeah, <clears throat> like he he has a lot to him. I think mm-hmm. that could be used. Uh, yeah, like in a in, in a humorous way. In a humorous or, way, yeah. or in a serious way. Yeah, uh, it could go either way. But uh, he he's a good boy. You know? <laughs> <laughs> he is the best. Boy. Actually, uh, <clears throat> something interesting about because I was reading uh, Donny Cates's Guardians of the Galaxy. I need to get back into it. I think I'm like three issues behind maybe uh-huh. uh but cosmo runs into lockjaw and greets him as a prince or as like a great leader or something like that and you see like lockjaw and cosmos communicating psychically uh-huh. so you see like little thought bubbles of yeah. lockjaw that's great and uh it looks like they're just playing with each other <laughs> On the yeah. book, but it's actually like, Your Royal Highness, and uh, down, my servant. Uh-huh. <laughs> be, continue to be a good boy. Yeah. Uh, but Lockjaw, I can see being a character that should be played around with. But like I said, I kind of want to see him be killed off mm-hmm. and play around with the way characters respond to his death. Uh-huh. Because what's sadder than killing a dog? Or as you said, you put down or euthanized. <laughs> uh-huh. So you'd play around with Lockjaw, have him appear in more stories and give uh-huh. him more appearances. Maybe have him, maybe have him, uh, give him a blockbuster MCU movie. <laughs> Why not? I mean, like yeah. we got we got Airbud and. I mean, the rest of the Inhumans <laughs> don't need a movie. Just give us a Lockjaw movie. Well, I feel like the Inhumans had their chance that didn't include Lockjaw, and. <laughs> Imagine how. I can't help but wonder if things have gone according to plan Mm -hmm. and the Inhumans became a movie instead of a TV show where Marvel characters go to die at the time. Uh (laughs) Would we have seen Black Bolt crash through those Shatari ships and fight off Thanos? That would have been sick. Instead of Captain Marvel. That would have been cool, man. That would have been sick. And, Like, like, they did introduce, like... Some characters that are tied in with, with uh, the Inhumans. The Inhumans. Ronan the Accuser was uh-huh. a big he, part of Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah, he's a Kree. Uh-huh. But yeah, Lockjaw's a character you would like to play around with. And mm-hmm. uh, the character I would like to frag to play around with, I'd say would be, I'd like to see played around with is Jack of Hearts. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think uh, Jack of Hearts is just like, is just weird enough that I would love to see what, how he would fit in the current mm-hmm. Marvel landscape. Yeah. Uh, see if there's any space for him. Uh, squeeze him into Guardians of the Galaxy, because why not? Or uh-huh. or maybe interact with the Fantastic Four or something. Just do something with uh-huh. Jack of Hearts. Yeah, A well, one-shot. Or Jack of Hearts 2099. I mean, is that going to be a thing? Introduced into, like, the MCU? No idea. I highly <laughs> doubt it. We'll see. <laughs> But uh, I don't know. I, I was thinking because like how he got his powers and like you know the the movies changed some of the origin bet- behind some of the characters. So like uh, Jack of Hearts is a product of Earth, also just like Adam Warlock. Even yeah. though in the movies it's not hinting that way. But um, you know maybe he could just be created somehow by some other group of people. Some other group of people. What if they make him an inhuman? Yeah, and then or a mutant. They they could adapt. Yeah, his whole character yeah something and i mean maybe he'll keep that same that same costume who knows <laughs> what if mm-hmm. instead of introducing jack of hearts they introduce wonder man and wonder man who starts off as an actor before he becomes wonder man is playing jack of hearts mm-hmm. in what the mcu equivalent of a superhero movie would be in that universe <laughs> Now we're getting somewhere. <laughs> now we're getting so because Jack of Hearts, his costume looks like weirdly Shakespearean. Right, it does. So what yeah. if it was just like a character in a Shakespeare play mm-hmm. or something like that? Like a jester gone. Rogue? Yeah. There's... Would he be a bad guy in this story? Why not? <laughs> do something with Jack of Hearts. Anti-hero? I ran out of characters, so uh-huh. Jack of Hearts, frag him. All right. Well, good. <laughs> Uh, and uh, now we'll move on to a section where I like to call Baddest Bastage, where we talk about a character and their chances against Lobo. And uh, I really just sort of came up with this because Taylor is a big fan of this character, mm-hmm. and I just really wanted to give him an opportunity to just go nuts and talk about Moon Knight. So Moon Knight, 
I, I like Moon Knight, so him against Lobo is kind of a bad thing. <laughs> bad matchup. Uh, in my opinion, uh, he would get stomped. It's a horrible matchup. He would get stomped pretty hard by Lobo. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, he, he can get creative, you know, in a similar way that Batman could, I think, using uh, I technology. Guess. But I don't think it's going to cut it in any scenario. No. No, he's <laughs> um, not. Because Lobo has regenerator, regenerative factor. He has, you know, just like way more power. Mm. Uh, if Moon anything, I, I don't think Moon Knight and Lobo would get along, mm-hmm. but I could see Jake Lockley and Lobo getting along. <laughs> yeah, he's pretty down to earth. Yeah. Well, Jake um, Lockley is more of like a bruiser. He's sort of, he's the aggressive one uh-huh. of Moon Knight's personalities. And I think I can see Jake Lockley and Lobo just going and getting a beer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Or like going at it with each other. Or trying to go at it with each other. Mm-hmm. And, uh, Stephen Grant and Mark Spector, those personalities are conscious even, would be like, why are you socializing with this? <laughs> yeah, so Conchu would pay him a visit while yeah. they're they're out having a beer. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, Jake, what are you doing? I'm socializing here. Get off my case, Conchu. <laughs> uh-huh. Can't I just have a buddy that's an alien zonian bounty on or something? <laughs> we just got to go get drunk. It's a China. <laughs> but maybe Lobo could confirm if Conchu's real or not. Maybe. I, I don't think he can. He'll be like, Conchu, what's a Conchu? <laughs> yeah, what's a fragging Conchu? What the frag's a Conchu? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I'd be curious to see, like, those two on the same screen or on the same page as each on other, because that's page. never happened. No, it, it um, never happened, and I don't think it ever will. <laughs> yeah, not likely. Uh, but not likely, but I think it'd be cool. I, mm-hmm. Of course, Moon Knight would get creamed. Yeah, he, I mean, would. there's been some stretches with writing. So, like, I've seen Moon Knight take Deadpool. Yeah. Which is weird, I think. Well, the thing <laughs> is that Deadpool is careless, and that's the only thing that I think yeah. could work to Mark's uh, advantage is that Lobo could be a little careless. He could be a little prideful as well. Mm-hmm. So he could use Lobo's own hubris against him. Right. Uh, to try to gain the upper hand. Yeah, but I think Lobo does always think one step ahead. Usually. As we saw in uh, Omega Man number three, he does plan ahead. Yeah. <laughs> That's the whole purpose he... of the Graflings. He knew they'd be attracted uh-huh. to Callista's aura. Uh-huh. Yeah. Right, exactly. He always, he always does his research ahead of time. Mm-hmm. That's why in this imaginary story of Lobo versus Moon Knight... Lobo would be on Earth for something else entirely than Moon Knight. Or maybe, yeah. dude, what if it was like werewolf aliens invading <laughs> the planet and Lobo's hunting them down? Wow. So that and then that's where they lead to is Moon Knight. Yeah, and Moon Knight is Moon Knight <clears throat> doesn't recognize that there's a werewolf <laughs> shape shifting werewolf aliens uh-huh. on planet Earth. I like it. And he just knows that this guy, Lobo, is tearing through New York, and Daredevil isn't doing anything about it. Spider-Man isn't doing anything about it. Mm-hmm. So Moon Knight's like, oh, they must be out of town dealing with cosmic shit or whatever, because he never gets invited. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, and then uh, Moon Knight's going after Lobo, and then eventually they team up to take care of this uh, shape-shifting werewolf alien threat. Mm-hmm. That would be good. Yeah, that that could be I, an interesting story. I think we got something. I think we got. We're gonna pitch this. <laughs> we got a bad as um, bastard pitch. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, or if they teamed up together, right? Like, so Moon Knight's teamed up with like Punisher. Yeah. And I don't want to say Punisher is like Lobo, but uh, Punisher is more pretty... like solid as far as like being aggressive characters. Uh huh. Yeah, like hard-headed. a ruthless guy. Ruthless, uh-huh. except Lobo has a little bit more personality to him than my wife and child are dead, and I'm a Vietnam vet that doesn't mm-hmm. have a brain that works good. Da 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 da. <laughs> exactly. So maybe, like, if they teamed up, that could be Moon Knight's way doing that cosmic stuff, right? Yeah. He, Lobo could make him tag along. Yeah. Just hop on the the hog. Hop on the, hop on the space <laughs> hog, and they go to the werewolf base on the moon. Uh huh. <laughs> Yeah, even if it's a one shot, you know <laughs> even if that it's a one that shot. opens the the convo. <laughs> the greatest this. crossover you didn't know you needed. <laughs> oh, That'd be great, actually. <laughs> now I really want bring this. bring Moon Knight to the moon. Yeah, I'm I'm really 
Well, they've done it a couple times as as like stories that happen in uh, Moon Knight's head. Like that was huh. part of the Jeff Lemire yeah. run of Moon Knight. But yeah, that that'd be, that'd be really <laughs> cool actually. Lobo and Moon Knight tag. Team. Yeah. But uh, <clears throat> Lobo's clearly the baddest bastard in this matchup. Yeah. It was kind of unfair. Pretty clear. Yeah. I'd say. Pretty, <laughs> pretty clear. Although Moon Knight has fought intergalactic mm-hmm. threats before, especially in the Infinity War crossover yeah. where he fights Moonshade, yeah. an evil doppelganger of himself. So yeah. Moon Knight does have some experience in this he's, field. He's faced off against, yeah, like Doom. Yeah. Uh, Sentry, like later with... Vengeance of Moon Knight, he faces Sentry. Uh-huh. So maybe Moon Knight does have a chance here. Maybe he does. At least can survive it. Uh, for me, the part that will really determine it is whether or not he can take Conan the Barbarian in a fight in this upcoming Serpent War Ooh. crossover. Because yeah. for me, Conan's the man's man. Uh-huh. Uh, if Moon Knight can take on Conan, or at least fight on his level, then I think mm-hmm. he has a chance yeah. against Lobo. Granted, Lobo has more powers than Conan the Barbarian. Uh-huh. But I, I think there's... Still earn that title of exactly, bad bastard. of being a bad bastard. Uh-huh. One bad bastard. <laughs> yeah, that's our show. Uh, let me know how we can improve, because, God, just going through this, and <laughs> we're not going to have a chance to, like, go back through any of this or anything like that, because I got to get going in about in 30 minutes or so, mm-hmm. and you probably have to go back home and... Do yeah, something. do some research yeah. on <laughs> on all these uh, topics we discussed. Yeah. <laughs> but we wanted to leave the listeners with a open-ended question, right? Yes. Uh, who do you think is a batter bastitch, Lobo or Moon Knight? Uh, I'm going to try to get a poll up on Twitter. I'll probably like add a little recording thing to the end of this as to where you can find us on Twitter and vote on a poll as to who's the baddest bastitch. But I am going to start up an email specifically so that way you guys can send suggestions on how to improve the show, uh, what type of layouts we should do, what she would keep, what should we drop, and also just like way for you to ask questions or different talking points uh, so that way we could or at least I could talk about Lobo with you guys because Taylor, <laughs> Taylor's a bit of a no-bo on a lot of Lobo. <laughs> but through the course of this podcast, I hope I can make him a convert uh, to the Church of the Three-Headed Fish God. Yeah, and I think the two readings you did assign, they, they definitely, like... They're a good... Uh, they set a bar. You yeah, know, they and, do uh, set a bar for the character. And before reading them, I already was pretty interested in Lobo. Yeah, um, simply because I won't shut up about him. <laughs> yeah, and like you pointed out, more interesting than like Punisher, obviously, but yeah. <laughs> interesting, you know, backstory. Yeah. Um, and so my working understanding is just going to get better and better. Yeah, eventually. So, so then I won't be a no-bo. <laughs> <laughs> a no-bo on Lobo. Uh, but... Yeah, if you have any suggestions, ways to improve the show, any uh, Lobo comics that you want us to cover, please send them to axeabastitch at gmail.com. That's the email I'm hoping to get us to use. Axe, spelled A-X-E. Bastich, spelled B-A-S-T-I-C-H. And uh, one thing I will say about Emmett... Emma J. Scanlon's performance as Krypton on an unrelated note, kind of related note, is that it is pronounced Bastich, not Bastich. He did get it by that last episode of Krypton Season 2, but still. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I cringed every time he said Bastich instead of Bastich. Uh, that's one thing, but other than that, he did a really good job. Oh, yeah, axabastich at gmail.com. Uh, where can people find you, Taylor, if you want to be found? Well, <clears throat> my uh, comics only Instagram um, is always dot tilted. Okay. So that is uh, always spelled like normal. Dot T I L T D. Awesome. And that's my gram. That's your gram, man. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's always posting like additions to his comic book collection. He's a big Fantastic Four, Moon Knight, like old school Jack Kirby stuff. Mm-hmm. Definitely hit him up if you ever want to mm-hmm. talk about that type of stuff. And uh, you can find me on Twitter at To Explain Later. And you can find me on YouTube, To Explain Later, Twitch with the same. And you can find me on Instagram with To Explain Later 95. For some reason, To Explain Later is banned on Instagram, but 95, 
just fine. <laughs> and I am planning on getting a, a Twitter made specifically for this show where polls will go up. Uh, I will definitely add a little recording note at the end of this once I have that set up. But yeah, thank you for listening to the very first episode of the Big Bad Bastich Book Club. I'm hoping for the next episode, which will be recorded much, much later and probably through Skype or Discord. If nobody sends in suggestions, we'll just cover Lobo's next appearance in a Mega Man. And uh, why not one of the new ones that are coming out, like Tales of the Dark Multiverse, Blackest Night, because I have a feeling that's going to be a really cool Lobo appearance. Maybe not a Lobo story, but a Lobo appearance. Or maybe we'll do the last Zarnian miniseries. Hmm. Like, both of us just read through that and we give an overall summary of the miniseries instead of the individual issues. Mm -hmm. Maybe we'll just have it be a poll on the Twitter account as to which one of those we should do next. Uh, Mm -hmm. But, yeah, thank you for listening, and uh, I hope you have yourself a Fragtastic day, you ornery bastiches. Or Clydes, you're Clydes. You're not bastiches, you Clydes. <laughs> Thank you for listening. <laughs> oh, hey, to explain later again, you Clydes, just checking back to give you some updated info on where you can contact and follow the show. For suggestions, queries, and ways to improve, please email axabastich at gmail.com. That is A-X-E dot A dot B-A-S-T-I-C-H at gmail.com. If you want to follow the show on Twitter to participate in polls and other ornery content, look for at Bastich Book Club. That is B-A-S-T-I-C-H-B-O-O-K-K-L-U-B. Or just search Big Bad Bastich Book Club on Twitter. If you enjoyed the show and you want to see it grow, give it a positive rating, share the show with friends, and tell them to do the same. Who knows? With enough fragments doing it, the suits at DC will get the message. Thanks for listening, and if you're reading anything with the bow, welcome to the club, Clyde. <laughs> <laughs>